Hello everyone. Today we'll take a quick dive into dip ROMs you can use in hobby projects. And I'll also give you a little hack you can use to replace one with the other. I mainly use these two different kinds of ROMs. The Winbond W27C512 is an EEPROM in a 28 pin package and is 64k. And it's super cheap and I have a lot of them. It's a little bit frustrating to work with because it needs a high voltage programmer and it also takes about 30 seconds to program. The SST 39SF010 is a flash-based ROM in a 32-pin package and it's 128K. It's still in production, so you can get brand new ones for about $3, and I recently found out you can also get used ones for about the same price as the Winbon ones. It's also 5V programmable, so you can even program it with an Arduino in a pinch. And if I use my trusty TL8662 programmer, the programming cycle is only about 5 seconds. So why don't I use the flash ROM for everything? It seems way better in every way, right? Well, the issue comes down to physical size for one thing. For the breadboard computer, I use a 28-pin ROM, and for the 65 Arduino that's based on it, I use either an old 24-pin or 28-pin ROM. For my full-size 6502 single-board computer, I use a 28-pin for the character ROM for the video output, but I also use either a 32-pin or a 28-pin for the main ROM. And of course, the BIOS ROMs in my PC XT are also both 28 pins. The other thing is I just like to use older things if I can get away with it to be slightly more period correct for these builds with retro chips, even if it is a bit more inconvenient. But what if I wanted to make an adapter board or something to use the faster, easier to program and more available 32 pin ROM instead of the slow old 28 pin ROM? How would that work? Well, if we take a look at the schematic symbols in KiCad, they don't look so similar, except they obviously have a lot of the same signal. It looks like one has power on pin 28, the other on 32, and one has ground on pin 16, the other on 14, and the chip and output enables seem different too. At least that's what it looks like, until we grab the physical layout from the datasheets and compare them side by side. Suddenly it's pretty clear that pins 3 to 16 on the 32 pin ROM line up perfectly with pins 1 to 14 on the 28 pin ROM. And the same goes for the other side. That actually means the only difference is the power pin and the first and last two pins. Interesting. I bet that means we can just plug in the physically bigger ROM and jumper power from the no connect pin to the power pin and we're almost done. Maybe. But before we go back to KiCad and think about hooking it up, let's dig a little bit deeper because this perfect lineup can't be a coincidence, can it? Of course not. The reason these two chips from two different companies on different ends of the globe are so similar is due to the JETIC Solid State Technology Association. That's not a dyslexic acronym, but because they used to be the Joint Electron Device Engineering Council. And the device part came about when tubes stopped being a thing. Either way, they are the standards organization responsible for creating open standards that make things easier for us. In their own words, on their sign-up terms of service, JEDEC standards and publications are designed to serve the public interest by eliminating misunderstanding between manufacturers and purchasers and facilitating interchangeability and improvement of products. Facilitating interchangeability, that's the keyword here. Since both these ROMs, probably produced 20 years apart, fall into the same category of 8K to 128K EEPROMs in the JEDEC standard 21C section 3213, we have the explanation of why they're configured as similarly as possible, even though they're very different internally. I couldn't find the standard diagrams publicly available, but of course, I could buy the 3000 page standard car hard copy for $1500, but that would take three weeks for production and we can't wait that long. I think we can live with the info we have available in the two datasheets for our purposes though. But that's the explanation of why we're in luck. Side quest over. Of course we can't use the full capacity of a 32 pin ROM, but it looks like it's easy to match the 28 pin capacity. So to make a 32 pin ROM work in a 28 pin socket, we'd first have to connect VCC to pin 30 where power would be in a 28 pin socket. Since we can't let the write and enable pin float, since that might write to it accidentally, we have to put a pull up on that pin. 
Ideally, we'd also connect address line 16 to ground, since we can't let that float either. But since this is supposed to be a hack and I rarely need the whole 64k we have available, instead I'll tie it to A15. What that means is the first 32k of data has to be written to the first quarter of the ROM, and if we need the second 32k available, we'll have to write the data to the last quarter of the ROM. I think you'll see why that makes sense in a second. We could make a PCB adapter out of this circuit, but this is a hack after all, so let's skip that step and move straight to the soldering. I like doing circuits dead bug style, but since we'll need the pins in the right places when we're done, let's try to keep this bug alive. First I cut a piece of uh, hookup wire to about the right length, and then I tin both sets of pins so it's easy to solder the wire. Since we've already got plenty of solder on pin 30, we can just tack the 10k resistor onto that before we solder it to the right enable pin on pin 31. On the other side, I noticed that I picked the worst candidate for soldering straight to the pins as they have a huge layer of oxidation that no amount of flux will ever save. But it looks like I got it on there well enough, so let's see if it works before I bring out the sandpaper. Let's see if we can still burn the ROM for the 65 Oino. Even though we already made a serial bootloader for it in the last video, we'll probably have to refresh the ROM sometimes. So let's bring out the TL866 and change our chip in the assembly and burn script. It looks like something is off as it doesn't even read at all. Um, let's see. Oh, it looks like it has a bent pin. Besides all the oxidation, that's not helpful either. Let's burn it twice to make sure and see what it'll do. Okay, that doesn't look great, but let's see what a reset does. Okay, it looks like it works. Or does it? When I try to clear the screen, it crashes. Something is clearly wrong here. Let's see how sensitive it is. Oh wow, even when I move my hand over it, it crashes. I know exactly what this is. We have an ice cold solder joint. If we bring out the multimeter, I'm absolutely sure we won't read 300 kilo ohms between pin 2 and 3. Ah, over range. Let's see if the resistor is good. Yep, still fine. I guess I really should have brought out the sandpaper before soldering to these pins, or used quite a bit more flux. Let's see if we can get it soldered a bit better. That doesn't look good, but it does look a bit less freezing. And the multimeter agrees. And if we put it back in the 65 Oino, it works. Now for the 65 Oino, it's fine that it extends a bit over the edge, but what if we grab the XT motherboard here? Since I changed the BIOS ROM, I actually heard that's a pretty common problem, but right next to it there's an IC, so this won't work, right? Actually, no problem. What I do in those cases is kind of simple, but it works. I just use an extra 28 pin socket to levitate the pins a bit, so they don't short out the other IC. Just don't push it into the socket too hard, since you don't really have anything to hang on to when you try to pull it out from the extra socket. And of course I broke mine when trying to do just that. But let's see if it still works in the 65 Oino and call it a day. Thanks for watching.